Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Lucien, for having us here today. Kind of trying to put this back up. Um, there it is. Uh, so, who here has participated in an improv everywhere? Uh, okay, cool. Which ones? MP3 experiment. MP3 experiment. Handless subway. Handless subway ride. The one here. Okay, awesome. Uh, and how many people have seen our videos on the internet? Okay, good, good, most of you. Uh, cool, well, I'm going to uh, just tell the story of how I got started. Um, just going to talk for about 15 minutes today, and then we'll do questions and answers and talk about anything you guys want to talk about. Um, so I'll talk about how I got started, and then I'll show a couple of videos, maybe that you haven't seen before, um, unless you've seen all of them. Uh, so I moved to New York City in 2001. I just graduated college. And I wanted to be an actor or a comedian. Um, I had done uh, I did improv in college, and I'd also done drama in college. I was a theater major, and it's very difficult to be 22 years old and move to New York City and try to get into that field, as it is with any creative field. Um, and while I was kind of waiting around for some type of big break or some opportunity um, in theater or comedy, I wound up playing a prank, and it kind of changed my life. Uh, and what happened was I, I was hanging out with a college friend and he remarked that I looked like Ben Folds from <laughs> Ben Folds Bob, uh, or now solo Ben Folds. I don't really look like him apart from the fact that I'm white, I have dark hair, I'm from the South, so maybe we have a similar accent, sort of. Uh, but I was wearing some shirt that was, I got at H&M, it was a little bit trendier than what I normally wore, and that's why I said that. So I said, you know what, let's go test this out. And I went to a bar in the West Village, sat down by myself at the bar for about a half an hour. And over that period, my friend entered separately, he ordered a meal on the other side uh, of the bar, and when he was done on his way out, he walked by me and said, oh my god, I'm a huge fan, you're Ben Folds, right? <laughs> Clearly, he said that. And he said, I have all of your albums. I love what you do. You know, please uh, give me an audio. So I did. <laughs> and he stepped away and ordered a drink and went to the other, another part of the bar. Well, everyone had heard that. And for the next four hours in this bar, I was Ben Folt. I was treated like a celebrity. So other people came up to me and asked for autographs. People came up and posed for photos with me. Uh, the bartender started giving me free drinks. And the, Two very attractive women who I purposely sat next to immediately wanted to talk to me. Had been ignoring me for the previous half hour. Um, so I, you know, I, I had a great conversation with them, and it was it was really exciting for me because in a way it was an acting role. I had to pretend convincingly to be someone who I wasn't. I was a fan of Ben Folds, so I knew a lot of his life specifics and was able to fake what I didn't know. Um, and it lasted four hours, and it was this amazing experience. And at the end of the night. I, I realized that we kind of had a choice, like I could make some type of announcement that everyone had been fooled, or I could just be very gracious and thank everyone for their, you know, companionship and then just leave. And that's what I decided to do. Just, uh, you know, my friend who I was waiting on, and he's available now, I'm going to go meet up with him, but it's been great meeting all you guys. And I got excited about the idea of giving somebody else an interesting experience and not explaining it, not having like a big reveal moment, a big you're in candy camera or you've been pumped or whatever type of moment. Instead, just let, you know, letting them have that story, whether they eventually figure it out or not. And I figured that you know, if somebody did Google Ben Folds and realized that he's 10 years older than me and I don't really look like him, or realized that he was doing a live show in Australia on the very night that uh, <laughs> They would then still have a pretty interesting anecdote, which was, I was in a bar one time and two guys made me think that I hung out with a celebrity for four hours and then disappeared. They didn't ask for money, they weren't advertising a product, uh, they didn't give me a flyer for a, a, a show or a fight, they just disappeared. So, uh, I decided, well this is, this is cool. Uh, I, I had like an awful temp job uh, working at a reception desk and that Monday morning I just typed up that story and put it on geocities.com slash improv everywhere, which I just made up because I was about to start taking improv classes. And in a way, it had been spontaneous and improvised what we had done. Although I regret that name because it confuses people. Um, so uh, I started taking classes at the Upright Citizen for Dave Theater, and I started meeting other comedians, other improvisers, and, and quickly kind of found uh, a group of people who was interested in doing these types of performances with me, so I was able to get larger numbers of people. And it, it definitely started very small. So I'm going to show you the very first no-pants subway ride. 
Um, this was January of 2002, and I came up with the idea of riding the train in your underwear, but doing it in a way where one person would enter a train car uh, in their underwear, then the next stop, another person would get on in their underwear as well, acting like they don't know each other, and then that would happen every stop for so many stops. And how would people react to that? So we went and did it in January of 2002 on the 86th train. So this is filmed with a hidden camera. I'll step away so I don't block the video. Um, this is filmed with a hidden camera. Uh, that girl who you just saw, she's the star of this video. She's not in on it, but uh, the camera just happens to kind of focus on her. These are two Danish guys who sit down right next to my hidden camera. And the camera is just uh, a, a crappy JVC mini TV camera that is on somebody's lap with a magazine on top of it, disguising it. And that's me right there. Um, she looks at me right now. <laughs> can't really see, but you'll have some clear that I'm going So yeah, so we're wearing, you know, uh, hat, scarf, gloves. Uh, I think I even have like a disc man or something in 2002. Uh, but yeah, she's noticed me, but decided to go back to reading her great book. <laughs> Uh, so in the meantime, I have six friends who are waiting in the next six consecutive stops, and they're planning on entering this car. And the, the train is now pulling into Canal Street, I think. The second stop along the line. Secret little prank and more of like just a parade. Um, and but I still organize it. We, I divided people up amongst 80 different subway cars by like birthday, and um, it still worked. Where people got on, one person got on the first stop, one person got on the second stop, and then like it started multiplying exponentially how many people got on. Um, and we're doing it again this January. There's already a Facebook event up um, that's linked to on the website, so you're all certainly invited to come participate. I think there are about 2,000 people who have already confirmed. <laughs> uh, a little concerned for how many people might. Uh, uh, so uh, after I, you know, kind of had this website and people started finding out about it, I was able to get more and more people to participate in events and do things that were a little bit more elaborate. Um, and this next event was kind of like the first large-scale thing that I did, um, and it was done. 
here uh, in the, um, you guys know this building right on 14th Street, it's the five minutes basement of the DSW Forever 21. Um, I was walking uh, by one day and I saw a girl who was dancing in the window of Forever 21. And, you know, it's fluorescent lights and it was nighttime and I could so very clearly see her and it was very unusual and I you know, stopped to watch her and after a minute her friend came around the corner and they laughed. It seemed like maybe she had been dared to dance. Uh, but that gave me the idea, looking at that window and seeing that there were about 70 other windows around it, that I should get someone in every single window to dance and do other things. So that's the way I did. You can see there's kind of these black figures in each of these windows here. Uh, so uh, I had 70 performers show up, and I stood in the park giving hands. <laughs> No jumping jacks allowed. <laughs> Literally like grabbing people and removing them. Uh, I thought, but I thought it was very funny to learn that that is evidently a policy of DSW. <laughs> um, or if not that, you know, I, I, mean, I can't blame them. There probably isn't a policy for how to handle that. Um, so, uh, so some of you guys have been to our MP3 experiment project before. I'm going to show you a time-lapse video of one of those um, quickly. Uh, this was, the, well the MP3 sprint is a project where we do where we put like a 45 minute MP3 on the internet, everybody downloads it, puts it onto their iPod, shows up at a public place, and they've also synchronized their watch with my website, and then everybody presses play at the same time. And the MP3 is instructions from a voice, as well as original music. Um, so this was done down in the Battery Park neighborhood, it started at the Yacht Harbor, and after about 20 minutes of activities there, everybody walked down to Nelson Rockefeller Park, um, which you can see here. Uh, so this is a time-lapse video that's sped up nine times. Of, you won't hear the instructions, so just see the people. And here's some of the people. So these, uh, these ants kind of entering the space are our participants. There were 825 of them this year. So all these people uh, sunbathing have no idea what's about to happen, have no idea that all of these people are kind of invading their space. <laughs> Uh, everybody was wearing red, blue, yellow, and green t-shirts, just randomly, those were the instructions. And kind of the first activity you'll see here is forming a human dartboard. Uh, everybody with a green shirt was told to clump together. And then all the red shirts. And then the blue shirts. And then the red and green are told to switch places. And then the yellow shirts act as the darts for the dartboard. <laughs> and at this point, if you want to freeze tag it in so the green team may get it. <laughs> and then red is it. <laughs> blue. Yellow. And then the last instruction was for everyone to lie down on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a, it's a fun participatory event, it's kind of 
more about the partic participants having a good time and enjoying themselves, but there is also the added effect of all these people who happen to be in the area not knowing what the hell is happening. And it's completely silent as well, because no one can hear anything, obviously, because it's on headphones. Um, my mailing list has gotten really big. I have like 25,000 or so New Yorkers who are on this mailing list who want to come participate, or at least 25,000 email addresses. Uh, so I started trying to narrow it down, and this was the summer of 2008. I sent out an email asking, for uh, identical twins. And are you identical twins? Yes. Oh. Well, I might do another twin thing. You should send me your email address. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so here they are. I'm going to skip past me explaining what the rank is. So I can explain. Although I will point out, those glasses that I'm wearing there, those are um, hidden camera glasses. Uh, you can see it's a somewhat obvious like, thing that's coming down into my jacket. Um, and that's how this was filmed with technology like that. Um, but anyway, the idea was to create a human mirror on the side where the twins could sit directly across from each other. Thank <laughs> you. 
there and, and watching the reaction of people. And I think most of the people watching people as they make the decision to give a hot dog. <laughs> I like this woman in the white coat. It was very, we didn't know how it was going to work out and how people would react to it, but I think like probably 90% of the people that went by decided to give them a high five, um, which we thought was awesome. And I will say that we did that in February. It was like maybe a few weeks to a month before swine flu became a big deal. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if it would have worked as well if we'd done it in like March of this year. Uh, but Rob washed his hands before and after and did not get sick. It was fun. People always ask that question. Um, so I guess I'll open it up to questions if any of you guys have questions. Yes. I have a quick question about Frozen Grand Central. Okay. Um, like, how do you do that? Like, I get yelled at, like, trying to take a picture anywhere in there. How the hell do you have, like, five cameras in Grand Central Station? Yeah, well, we, we had, our cameras were hidden inside suitcases and things like oh, that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, the hiding, it's important for us to try to have our cameras be as hidden as they can be, um, because if people are so you know aware of these types of events now, partially because a lot of my videos have gotten so many views on YouTube, uh, and you know to get that you want to get that natural reaction of somebody not knowing that they're on camera. So uh, I have some devices that I use, like uh, you know eyeglass cameras and the button camera, and then also um, now the DSLR cameras can shoot like HD video, like the Canon Mark II or whatever it is. Like that's been a great thing for us. The last couple of videos we've done, we've used those because it just looks like you're taking a photo and not like a really beautiful HD video that those things can do. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. I have a question about grocery store musical. How uh -huh. did you guys come to this decision to work with Trident to do that? Um, Trident approached me, so I, I get approached by brands and marketers and advertising agencies every day. Like probably like two or three emails every day. Like it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and 90% of it is stuff that like, 95, 99% of it is stuff that like just is not right. Like we want to get a bunch of people to do a flash mob in Times Square where you all eat Doritos at the same time and wear Doritos t-shirts. Like no, that's horrible. <laughs> I sent out an email for people to come do that, like no one would ever show up to anything I did again. Um, so I, I kind of look at, at all those things that I get, and, and every now and then we'll pick an opportunity where, okay, well this brand gets it, they do want to just sponsor me to do something and, and not get in the way of it. So um, the company that did the, uh, that I worked with, the marketing firm that I worked with, for, that approached me about this Trident opportunity, they um, had done the Where the Hell is Matt video where the guy dances all around the world. And I think that video is like, I've always said that video is like the perfect example of like, you know, a, a brand sponsoring a viral video. Like, the, you know, the video has nothing to do with gum. Maybe it has something to do with long lasting because it's <laughs> long lasting gum. The guy dances for a long time. Um, but he was already doing it. They just sponsored him to do something awesome. So that's kind of what I tell the brands and, and marketers that approach me. It's like, if you want to sponsor me to do something that I already want to do, and I'll say thanks to your brand for making this possible at the end of it, then you know, then that sounds great. So uh, I had done this project called Food Court Musical, where people sing spontaneously in a food court in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. I've always, I'd always wanted to do another one, and by working with them, we were able to get like really nice cameras and pay a location fee to a grocery store to be able to set up and, and do the whole thing. Uh, so that's that. Do the people in the mobs, do they actually pay, or do they do it for the love of it? Um, it's, it's, it's just for the love of it, yeah. It's volunteer. So if I do, um, on the rare occasion, like, you know, once a year, if I'm doing something for my website that is for the brand, then the actors get paid. Because, you know, there's a budget and everybody's getting paid. Uh, but that's usually like a small scale thing where, where I'm hiring actors. But the projects where, you know, it's 200 people walking in an invisible dog around this neighborhood, uh, you know, or people showing up to take their pants off, it's just, it's just a fun thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have a budget to pay 2,000 <laughs> Other questions, yes? Uh, what do you think about, the, there is some advertising that's similar to this idea like T-Mobile's I mean, there are like a, there are a lot of 
there have been a lot of viral videos and, and, and brand videos um, in the past year, especially, that I think have been very similar to things that we did. Um, but I don't really think there's anything that I can do about it. You know, you can't really copyright an idea. You definitely can't copyright, like, a style. And that T-Mobile video is, you know, the best example of one that got very popular is people dancing in a train station in uh, London. And it's, you know, I've, ne I've never done something with people dancing to a medley of songs in a train station, but I had done the people freezing in place in Grand Central Station, and their video was shot in very much the same style as my popular Grand Central video. Um, so I, really the most annoying thing for me was that I probably had to deal with about a thousand emails about it. Like, everybody I know, and everybody who's like acquainted with me in any way who saw that video, and everyone saw that video because it has like 10 million views, um, emailed me to say, did you do this? Were you a part of this? Did they ask you permission? Are you mad about it? Are you happy about it? Like, you know, this sort of point, I was like, stop asking me about the damn T-Mobile video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that was the most, the most frustrating thing. Oh, yeah, see you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting, it is an interesting thing. I understand why people want to talk about it. Um, so, you know, I, in a way, it's flattering. I, I think anything that's a good idea, um, and anything that gets popular, I think, advertisers are going to come in and try to co-opt it. So, you know, for us, I, I just try to always move on to new ideas um, to keep things fresh. Um, I think there's, I think what's even worse, like people might copy my style, but then like if an ad gets popular, everyone copies the other ad. Like there have been so many like flash mobs where people dance and do, you know, coordinated choreography like the T-Mobile video. Um, and and at, th at this point, it just seems so lame to me to see like like the fiftieth one that's just like that. So I've just made sure I'm not doing any like large number of people dancing for a long time. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Isn't it kind of cool to influence you know global phenomena in some major way? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, that, and that is why it's flattering. <laughs> It's flattering for people to copy it, period. I mean, the, the Grand Central video, which I didn't show because it was, it was on Tina's blog and you guys probably saw it, but, um, you know, it, uh, it's been seen almost 20 million times, which is crazy, but what was, like, more amazing to me is the amount of times it was copied, and it's been done in, like, two or 300 cities at this point. People have gone out and frozen in place for five minutes at, like, the train station or some public plaza. Um, and in like weird cities too, like like three different cities in China, uh, people froze in place in Tel Aviv one week and then in Beirut the next week, like at a time period where the countries were like having some like crisis where they were sending missiles across the border. Um, so it, it was really kind of amazing to watch that. And I have always had the attitude of like, if people like these ideas and they want to go out and do them, then please like let it spread. I think that's been good for the awareness of our website just to like be cool with that. Because you can't stop it, like you might as well just embrace it. Um, and I, I certainly never anticipated it. Oh, and, and the one thing too that happened with the Grand Central video is Law and Order decided to copy it. Has anybody seen the Robin Williams episode of Law and Order Special Victims Unit? Um, so Robin Williams played a guy who lives in New York City and has this website where he goes out and does these crazy things with people. <laughs> But he was a special victims unit, so he was also a murderer and a, and a sexual deviant. <laughs> so, that was weird. <laughs> but actually, like, the most, uh, oh, and the, the climactic scene is the detectives, like, catch him when he's frozen in place in Grand Central Station uh -huh. with, like, 200 other people. And they, like, very much copied my video, like, you know, like, recast it with people that kind of looked like the people in the video, stole the camera angles and all that. Uh, but ultimately, like, it was, it was pretty flattering to have Rob Williams play you on TV. And <laughs> <laughs> yes? Do you um, consider beforehand the legal implications of what you're doing, or do you kind of just go with it? Um, you did the uh, yearbook on the subway, mm -hmm. correct? I read, I read the blog, and there were a lot of comments like, well, how dare you act like an MTA official? When, right. You know, and, I understand where they're coming from, but you also know that it's just meant to be playful. Yeah, so. I think um, specifically for that one, the, there's a comment from like this guy who's a lawyer for the MTA who's notorious for like anytime somebody like uses Helvetica with a black background, like he sends them a nasty letter. <laughs> <laughs> he's like very like there was like a place in Brooklyn I think that was like using like subway that letters. Yeah. What's it called? That line bagels. Yeah. yeah. Line bagels. <laughs> 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 
so this same guy that went to, like I Googled his name, and he was also the one that like went after this bagel cup. He's like their attack dog. Um, but in terms of legality, like I have had the police called a few times, and we definitely, we don't break the law. Uh, at least I don't think we try not to break the law. I'm not trying to do that. But we do break like MTA policy or you know, social norms for sure. And so, so <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to research it like and see what's allowed like with the, um, with the subway yearbook thing, you know, it's not illegal to bring a chair. Like, we didn't break that many rules. Like, I tried to, like, not have, like, super obvious things that we're violating. So the people are, if the authority figure comes, they'll be confused by it long enough before they can figure out what it is that we're doing that's wrong. Um, well, that was, that was the first, the, or, well, the only one that I saw where it could have been offensive to some people. Like, most of them are just to make people laugh and it's a good time right. or whatever. But that's the only one I saw where it was sort of an impersonation. Mm -hmm that offended someone, and so I was just curious. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, honestly, I don't care if the MTA is mad that I appreciated them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hoax, it's a joke. I'm clearly not the MTA. There should be no confusion. Yeah. Do you, do you work with a designer on your website? Um, I don't, no. You guys probably don't have ideas to improve. I'm a designer, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Like um, I, I think I think you've done a really good job, and you figured yeah. out how to make this a full time. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm also an improv teacher at Enterprise Citizens Brigade. Oh, okay. My well, you would have um, a great time if you came up with an improv specifically for designers. I think. Yeah. 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 If anybody has any ideas, email me. But yeah, the website is just WordPress and with, with the, the K2 theme, and I have like a custom banner for it, but it's not that fancy, and I don't love it, but it's tough. Like, there's a lot of content on my website because I've been doing this for eight years, so, you know, I got like all of this, so many different things, and it's kind of hard to figure out how to display them all. But, yes? So, uh, I think it's interesting that you started with one incident with yourself and a friend and it's clearly grown to be as that yeah. picture demonstrates <laughs> more people. I'm, I'm wondering how uh, how you feel about your role changing going from a person who's doing it proud of yourself to really a leader of many yeah. and, and then um, you know having to go through emails. Are you happy about that or is it taxing uh, to the point where you want to stop at some point, but how does that change you? It's not yet. I mean, I, I, I you know, it, it can take up a lot of time, and I, I've got, like, a very detailed, frequently asked questions page, um, <laughs> and which, like, you know, is kind of laughing along how many things <laughs> like, I get a lot of questions, and then on my contact page, I say very boldly, like, please read the frequently asked questions page before you contact me. Um, so, you know, because I just had to figure out how to deal with the amount of email I get and the amount of requests that I get. So basically, anybody that emails me something and the question's answered there, it's just an automatic delete and I kind of fly through my day that way. Because it's amazing how many people, you know, come to the website for the first time, want to do no research, and want to ask the most obvious question that's like one click away. Like, it would take less time to click. Anyway. Um, but yeah, in terms of like my role in the group, like uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess as I've gotten older, I'm less interested in being an actor. I, I mean, at some point, at some point, this became what I did, and I was no longer interested in being an actor. I still perform every Saturday night at Upright Citizens Brigade. I played the group called Ruben Williams um, on Saturdays, so uh, so I get to I still get to perform you know, in front of the stage in front of the audience, but. Um, yeah, I guess a couple years in, I started like being more interested. Since it was my group, it's tough to like be in front of the camera and also be able to kind of have control over what's going on. Um, I, we did a thing in a Best Buy where I had 80 people put on blue polo shirts and khaki pants. <laughs> Best Buy. Um, and uh, when, uh, um, so when we did that, I, I put on a blue polo shirt um, and participated as well. I, I, I found that it was like, it was a little bit difficult. <laughs> it was difficult to like be able to handle the situation. Like the police came, they called the cops on us. Um, they freaked out, and it was hard for me to like be able to like figure out what was going on and see assess the situation when I was in a blue shirt and like looked as guilty as everyone else. So <laughs> sometimes it can be useful for me to like be able to blend in a little bit. Other questions? Yes. What's the largest number of people you use in your performances, and what is the ultimate goal of, of the number of people you'd like to use? Um, the largest number of people is we did uh, an MP3 expert, 
MP3 experiment project um, last this past summer on Roosevelt Island, and there were definitely over 2,000. And then there were also about 2,000 who came to the invisible dog thing. And if you don't know that, we use we had actually I had an email from this art group called No Longer Empty, who does like art gallery events and unique spaces and a lot of abandoned spaces. And uh, this guy Keith from that group emailed me and said. Uh, I'm on your mailing list, I like your website, I'm working with this new building, and they have 2,000 invisible dog leashes, would you like to use them? And I wrote back and said, yeah, sure, that sounds hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that idea is already written, I'll do that. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and Lucien was nice enough to let us you know, borrow all of the dog leashes for the day, but uh, you know, I just sent it out to my mailing list. I sent one email, and about 2,000 people probably showed up, and it's actually really difficult to be able to manage that many people. Like, we met in a space that's on the ground floor that's about the size of this, and 2,000 people could not fit in as we were. Not at all. Um, so that, that was <laughs> um, And I was in here, I was like, oh, great, everybody's fit, and we started passing it out. I was like, oh, cool, everybody's uh, gone, they've all been passed out, and then somebody, was my photographer came, and was like, there's a line around the block of people waiting to get it, and I was like, Oh, okay, all right, so, then, okay. so uh, it can be very difficult working with huge numbers of people. And I, I, I never really intended to work with huge numbers of people. And uh, you know, I get people use the word flash mob a lot, um, which is actually a phenomenon that started in 2003, a couple of years after I got started. Um, but the only reason that I really do flash mobs is because that's how many people want to come. Um, some ideas I think are great, but it's really idea specific. Like, um, if it just needs to be four people holding signs and one guy holding out his hand to give a high five, then, then that's the right number of people. Should we do one last? I think we have to close it here. Okay, one last one. So for the one in other cities, I've seen groups for improv everywhere, London and other, so right. is that people doing it on their own, or are you like, do you kind of guide them? Or it's people doing it on their own. Like, I was getting, you know, constant emails saying, I live in London, I live in Ohio, I live here, I want to do it too, I want to do it too. And I didn't want to just say like, no, you know, but at the same time, it's like, how do I say yes? Like, I don't live there, I can't really help you. Um, nor can I like let somebody have a franchise or a branch or whatever who I've never met before. Um, so it was, it was a difficult thing to figure out. And what I've done is I set up like a social network um, which is linked to on my site where if you live in London, you can find other people in London and you can organize to Ning and it's like, but you create your own social network is what I use and it's, it's an okay site. Um, so people have organized that way. Some, some cities have had some success and some have had not much success. Um, and I just say like, don't use the name improv everywhere, come up with your own name. But it's a very nuanced thing because I want, if they go out and use one of my ideas, I want them to say, we got this idea from improv everywhere, here's a link to the original, just so we're, we're credited for our idea. But I don't want them to go out and say, we are improv everywhere London, because somebody saying that could go out and like, kill a bunch of people. And, and <laughs> like, I just don't, I don't know who they are. Or, or more likely just do work that's not that interesting and not that good and it has my brain name attached to it. Right. Um, so it's you know it's been tough to kind of navigate that, but I think ultimately like it's good to like encourage people to spread it because I think it's a positive thing and it makes people happy. So cool. that's a good note to end. All right, thanks everybody.